The Lord be with you. Thank you. Welcome in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, it's good to see you this morning and to see many of you whose faces I saw last night luauing out at the pavilion. Um, it's the first annual ever luau. I think there will be a second. Right, Gail? If they'll attend. So there's your invitation for next year, luau. Um, but no matter what you had going on last night, you come here to lift up your voices in song and in prayer, to tune your ears to hear God's word and to respond with our lives because we trust that the living God is the one who meets us by his spirit and invites all of us in. And so with that invitation, I would invite you to stand and body your spirit and let's join together in our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let this household say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord say, God's steadfast love endures forever. And so we've come, God, trusting in that steadfast love. Some of us here this morning are sure of your love, which goes on and on for us, never failing, never giving up, always inviting us deeper in and further up. And some of us here need a reminder of that, or we're not even sure if, if you're here. Some of us are ready to sing the songs of worship this morning. Some of us hardly have a song in our heart but we're here. And so we pray, God, that you would meet us here as well. And that in fact, in the power of your Spirit, you would lift us up into that heavenly worship always going on around your throne with all your saints singing holy, holy, so that we might be changed by an encounter with you and be shaped more and more into the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray all of this. And together we say, Amen.
Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against You in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved You with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In Your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in Your will and walk in Your ways to the glory of Your holy name. And we lift up in this quiet moment our own personal and silent confessions to God. Lord, have mercy. Together we say, Amen. This is the good news for us yet again. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our sins from us. And so, dear friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And may the Holy Spirit give us the grace to live lives of forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You can be seated. I invite any young folks or young at heart folks to come forward. But seeing that they're all down the hall, we'll lift up a prayer for them this morning. Church, what is your prayer for all our children? They say, and also with you. Amen. This is our prayer, Lord that our children near and far, here and in churches all around the world would come to hear your word and grow in your grace. So help us to figure out good ways to nurture the children in the soil of your grace and guide us into faithful ways of opening the word with them so that they would grow up toward the light of your Son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. This morning, please listen to the prayer for understanding. Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that we may hear your word for us today through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today I will be reading Psalm 47, God's rule over the nations. Clap your hands, all you peoples, Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome. 
a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God is king over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we've been walking through the hot days of summer, we've been walking through some hot stories from the book of Acts, uh, exciting stories in the book of Acts in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. This book in which we find the early Christians called the way, learning to be attentive to the one who is the way and attentive to his lordship over everything, and the path he was calling them to walk as his witnesses, and the people he was having them encounter with his good news, and the power of his spirit alive in them, and through them, and around them. The book of Acts. It's a great book for this kind of time in our life together. Last week we heard the surprising story of Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus, and the surprise sending of Ananias to bless him. This week, there's another surprising story. And in all honesty, it's not really a story I would have picked for one of my last sermons with you. However, it is a story that's apparently so important to the gospel that it is told in 48 verses of detail in chapter 10, and then immediately retold, implications included, in chapter 11. It's retold like this. Listen carefully and well for God's word to us from the book we love. Now the apostles... And the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to retell the story step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, 
And in a trance, I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter! Kill and eat! But I replied, By no means, Lord! For nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice came from heaven saying, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. And then everything was taken back up into heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how the angel had stood in his house saying, send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God has given, even to the Gentiles, the gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Friends, this is the word of God. For us, the people of God, we say, thanks be to God. Holy God, once again, we come asking what we ask every week, and that is that you would make this a word for every one of us here today. And a way that even if just for a moment we hear the voice of your living word and know him breaking down the walls between us and filling us with a story of grace to tell and sending us as his body in the world. Come, Holy Spirit. We ask this in the name of Christ, and together we say, Amen. The list wasn't long, probably, but it was thick. The list wasn't long, but it was thick with importance, all the important reasons for Peter to keep in mind. The list wasn't long, but it was thick, thick with importance. They wear the wrong clothes, check. They wash the wrong way, check. They learn the wrong history, check. They eat the wrong foods. They keep the wrong customs. Check. They do the wrong things. Check. They worship God wrong. Check. The list wasn't long, per se, but it was thick with importance. All the important reasons why a good Jew like Peter 
would and should make a distinction between himself and any Gentile. That is, any non-Jew, any person of the world. There were lines that had been drawn, important ones, for ages to make a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Distinctions which distinguished them, ritual customs, holy washing, food laws, circumcision, as the holy and set-apart people of God in the world, and that distinguished everybody else as, well, not. And so, even in the earliest days of the church, for those who were following Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, mostly Jewish people, there was an understanding that if you were going to be right and righteous and part of the family of God, you had to accept and convert and keep all the customs of Israel, like circumcision, like food laws, like all the laws. The list wasn't long, per se, but it was thick. Thick with importance, all the important reasons to make a distinction between Jew and Gentile, in and out, them and us. Peter had probably learned the list in his earliest days and had carried it around not on any piece of paper but upon his heart into so many situations. What about you? Do you have the list? Who's on your list? They wear the wrong clothes. They do the wrong things. In fact, they stole your gift at the luau last night. <laughs> Completely unacceptable. <laughs> they keep the wrong customs. They learn the wrong history. Obviously, they're not from the valley. They've done you wrong. They look wrong. They sound wrong. Wrong. Who's on your list? Knowing you, it's probably not a very long list, but it might be thick. Thick with importance. All the important reasons to make a distinction between those who can be in, in the church, in your house, in your life, and those who are out. Between them and us. Who's on your list? The problem with our lists, though, yours, mine, and Peter's, is that God demolishes them and in their place gives us a drama of grace to tell and a means to guide us in it, and a first move we can make. The problem with our list, if you've got one this morning, right here, is that God demolishes our lists of distinctions. And in the place of a list gives us a drama of grace to tell, and a, a means of guidance, and a first move to make. God demolishes our lists. That's what Peter's learning in this story. In chapter 10, which I hope you'll go back and read in all 48 verses of glory, but then as he retells it to those who are bringing charges against him in chapter 11, Peter's learning that the lists are demolished. He has gone and eaten and associated with Gentiles, and people are saying, why have you gone to do this as a good believing Jew? And Peter retells the story. He says, I was in the city of Joppa, and I was praying, and suddenly, I was going to do this for the children's sermon, but, you know, suddenly a large sheep, it's blanket Sunday, so it's a blanket, a large sheep, Charlie, can you help me? I only have one more Sunday to do this, you know, so. 
yeah. A large sheet <laughs> was coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners. And in the sheet, Peter says, in the sheet I saw all sorts of animals, four-footed animals, <laughs> and beasts of prey, and reptiles, and birds of the air. They were <laughs> Charlie says that Peter was smoking some good stuff. <laughs> Maybe he just had a better prayer life than you, Charlie. You can put it down if you want to. I won't make you stand up here. And this sheet came down from heaven with all these animals, all these animals that you know I, a good Jew, would never go and cook up and eat. They weren't part of the diet for the Jewish law. And then I heard this voice, though, that said, pick up and eat. And I said, mmm, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered these lips. I keep the customs. But a second time, Peter says, a second time the voice from heaven came and said, what God has made clean, <laughs> they probably didn't look like that, what God has made clean, you must not call profane, unholy. And it happened three times. Then it was all taken up back to heaven. And right at that moment, right at that moment, three men from Caesarea, 30 miles to the south, came to our house. They were servants of a Roman centurion. And I was being invited over for dinner. And I knew then and there. Peter says, I knew the Holy Spirit was sending me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. Now, what's just happened? Well, one thing that's happened is that Peter has realized the vision in prayer, the vision, was not just about food. It's about the families of the earth. The vision, Peter realizes, is not about food. It's about people. The sheet coming down from heaven by its four corners represents the four corners of the earth, the world. And all those animals within it, all the animals that a good Jew would not eat, represent the Gentile nations who any good Jew would not associate with. In fact, I don't know this, but I wonder if the animals named specifically represent the nations surrounding Israel. Peter says there were beasts of prey. Do you know what one of the main emblems of the Parthian Empire to the east was? Close, griffin, winged lion, beast of prey. Do you know what was on Pharaoh's crown to the south? Cobra, reptile. Do you know what the Roman legions carried with them from the west? Eagle, bird of the air, right? beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air. Whether I'm right or wrong, this is representation of the Gentile nations, the non-Jewish nations, all the peoples who were on Peter's list that he was not supposed to associate with in any real ways. And so when Peter's told now to get up and eat, it's not just that he's being told to go have whatever you want for lunch. He is being told now to associate with those people whom he thought were unclean, unholy, and unfit to be part of the people of God. He is being told to not make a distinction between them and us. God is demolishing the lists. Paul, the apostle, would actually put it like this to the Gentiles later in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul said, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a circumcision made in flesh by human hands. Remember, you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has broken down the dividing wall, 
that is the hostility between us. God is breaking down the walls. God is destroying the lists. And God is naming those whom Peter called unclean, clean, acceptable, holy, welcome. Not through any custom or religious practice like circumcision, but through the blood of Jesus Christ. In Christ, all are now welcomed into the family of God. And all means all. Now, to be clear, what this doesn't mean is that we get to say, well, isn't God tolerant of everybody? Tolerance is what we're supposed to, you know, go and have when we're dealing in politics. Tolerance is what we're supposed to have with all religions. Tolerance is a purely modern notion that says, I don't have to love you, but I'm supposed to put up with you. God doesn't put up. God loves the world. And God so loved the world, in fact, the gospel says that he gave his only son to die for the forgiveness of all sins, that all might be reconciled to himself through his body on the cross, so that the most religious and moral person and the most irreligious and immoral person are both named guilty sinners under the cross. And the most religious and moral person and the most irreligious and immoral person both are welcomed into the embrace of Christ to believe in his mercy and to receive from him the Holy Spirit who generates the repentance that leads to life. God is demolishing the lists and welcoming all in so that there is no longer a distinction between them and us, but there's only us being renewed in the power of the Spirit and invited to to go deeper in and further up to the high country of salvation with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. God is demolishing the lists. And in a world full of lists between who flies the wrong flag and votes the wrong way and does the wrong thing in a world full of lists and finger pointing and lines drawn in the sand, the church is called to offer up a different story. You are called to offer a different story. God gives instead of a list for us to carry, because that's boring. When was the last time you got excited about a list? God gives us a drama of grace for us to tell. He gives a drama A drama about the God of grace who is for us, all of us. That's the second thing that Peter realizes here. He realizes this this is this is a drama he's found himself in. Peter says, if God has given even to the Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God, stop God? thwart God's plan. Peter realizes there's a drama going on, and the main actor is God, the God of grace who is for us. I mean, notice, who is the primary actor in this story? Well, Peter runs places, and the servants come places, but it's God. God gives the vision to Peter. God gives the vision to the centurion Gentile. God, the Spirit, says Peter, told him to make no distinction and to go. God, the Lord, says Peter, his word I remembered. God, says Peter, cannot be hindered. The story belongs to God. It's a drama of which God is the author and the main actor, building his church by grace. And this is the way it's always been, right? Remember back two years We heard the creation story. When God made the world, how did God make it? He called it very... Don't whisper it, just say it. Good! He creates it to shine with his gracious goodness. And even when when sin defaces his image in us and demolishes so much of what's good and separates us from God, what does God do? He draws near and says... 
where are you? And he graciously begins a rescue mission. He calls Abraham. You can remember this from last year. And he blesses him. And he says to him, in you, all the families of the earth, all the families, all, will be blessed. And the children of Abraham carry that gracious blessing and they witness it in their lives and they whisper it in the psalm we heard this morning, God is king over everyone. Until finally, in the fullness of time, the Father sends the Son in the power of the Spirit to live as the faithful, true Israelite and in His body to bless all the families of the earth with forgiveness and in His ascension to carry all humanity back into the presence of God. God is acting a drama of grace. And so, the story of Peter being sent is not an aberration from that drama, but it is the beginning of the fulfillment where Peter now goes to the centurion, the Gentile, the ends of the earth to bring the good news to all. And so, you now, stand as next in line after Peter to carry this drama, to tell this story to all in Rockingham and Augusta County. Do you know the number one way people have come to Mount Horeb, at least since I've been here? By invitation. By invitation. In the place of a list... God gives us a drama of grace for us to tell and invite others into. The way the Gentile centurion comes into the story of God is because God sends Peter to tell the story. And the way that people today are invited in to know the drama of God's grace is because God sends you to show and tell the story. In in your homes, with your families, in your work, in the places you go around these hills of the valley, God sends you. He is always using human agents. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Miriam, Deborah, David, Isaiah, Mary, Jesus comes in the flesh of a human being. Peter, John, Mount Horeb. In the place of a list, God gives us a drama of grace for us to show and tell. And he guides us. He gives us a means of guidance to do that well. Um, didn't you wonder, how, how does Peter know that it's the spirit he's following and not the Jiminy Cricket on his shoulder whistling? How does Peter know that it's the Spirit telling him to make no distinctions and not just, well, this is popular opinion of the day. We shouldn't make distinctions anymore. How does Peter know? And how do you know if you're sent to live out and show and tell this drama that you are going to do it faithfully? Well, Peter actually tells us, doesn't he? He says, I remembered the word of the Lord. I remembered the word of the Lord. How he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The way Peter knows that he is following the Spirit and not just the desire of his own heart is because he can test it by the word of the Lord. The word of Jesus. And the way that you are going to know, church, that you are faithfully following the Spirit's leading in these next few months, in these next few years, wherever he sends you, is because you're called to carry the word of the Lord in your heart, to hold it close, to know the saving story of God, so that in every moment, in every decision, in every surprising challenge like Peter faces, you may be able to say, the Spirit is telling us to do this, and not just my own heart. God gives us a means to guide us in telling the story faithfully. And it's his word. We know the word. So in the place of a list, God gives a drama of grace for us to tell and a means to guide us to do it rightly. And then finally, finally there's a first move that we're invited to make. And this is what I mean. 
the very end of the story, there's a first thing that they do after it's all said and done. Did you catch this? When they heard Peter's story, they were silent. Nobody huffed and puffed and said, well, no, you know, we're going to have to go back and check some books, Peter, then we'll get back to you. They were silenced. Nobody said, oh, finally, somebody's woken up. They were silent. Psalm 65.1 says, To you, O Lord, silence is praise. Maybe the first move we're invited to make when we're confronted by the drama of God's grace for us, all of us, is silence. Silence speaks of wonder. Like when you step out into the field and it's filled with a multitude of lightning bugs in July. You're quiet. Silence speaks of awe. Like when you stand before a masterpiece and you don't say, wow, you're just quiet. Silence says, we have heard your story of grace for us. All of us. And we know there is nothing we can add to it or subtract from it. All we can do is receive it. And then pray that you will continue to reveal it through us. Until there's only us in life and love with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
be seated. Having heard God's word for us, we're invited to respond, as our sisters and brothers have, down through the ages with the faith of the church from the Apostles' Creed. Would you rise and body your spirit? Let us say our creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. Sorry to have you doing some exercises this morning. Um, The God who welcomes us in also welcomes our prayers. And so we turn to God in prayer, uh, trusting that He hears us as we pray in the name and spirit of Jesus. So are there joys for us or concerns that we should lift up in our community today? Sylvia? Sylvia? Alright, so we give thanks for new life, a new great-granddaughter, Amelia Jean, born to the Clements. Praise the Lord. Lord, we do praise you for the way that you give us life and you nurture our life and you call us to a gracious life with you. We thank you for Amelia's life and we do pray that you would open paths and doors for us, for her, to grow up in that knowledge and love of you. Keep her parents strong in these first days with her, and may they be blessed by this life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Susan. So we uh, give thanks for this good news for Susan's brother uh, who is finally out of the hospital um, and is starting to recover. He said he has a balloon in his heart that's helping him to breathe, so he still has a little recovery time left. But we give thanks to God for that. Holy God, we thank you um, that you are the one who um, brings healing and hope. And we thank you for this good news for Susan's brother, Jeff. Thank you that he is breathing again, not in a hospital, but at home. We ask that you would continue to work through uh, the hands of um, rehab specialists and doctors and anyone who he has to deal with now so that he might come back to a full recovery and be about the things that you call him to do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let's continue to pray then for our world and for one another, and we'll continue to pray in this way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Faithful God, you are awesome, and before you, we bring our praises and our prayers, trusting that you're the one who hears us. Even as you heard the prayers of a Gentile centurion, even as you heard the prayers of Peter, so hear us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You are the king of the nations. We pray that your will would be done in every nation where you reign, that you would bend our leaders' wills to your ways, that you would bind the wounds 
of those facing pain, poverty, continued suffering from this pandemic, that you would build your kingdom on earth. And Lord, do it through us, if it be your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You revealed to your servant Peter your desire to make no distinction between Jew and Gentile, but gather one family into your house. Weave this plan into our hearts, Lord. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your good purposes here in the valley that in your good time all may serve you in harmony around your throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, you guided Peter by your word and spirit that he would know what to do. We pray that you would guide your church today in the same ways. Open your word to us as we listen to you. Do not let it fall on deaf ears. Baptize our hearts and our understandings with your Spirit's wisdom so that we would walk in the ways that you would have us to go and demonstrate your mercy in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, you were at work even in the house and home and heart of a man and family who did not know you, who was outside of the covenant promises of Israel. By your Spirit, we ask that you would keep calling those who do not know you today, but who are searching for truth, and keep equipping us with a story to tell that we might point others to the one who is truth, your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we lift up all those prayers which we have not named, but that we carry in our hearts this morning in this quiet moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. These things we ask in the name and spirit of Jesus Christ. And we pray now using the words that he has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As God's sent people, we're invited to offer our lives back to God and in service of God. And one of the ways that we show that is through our offering. Um, Today is a blanket Sunday which means that you can give a special offering to help Church World Service in providing blankets to those in need. I can't remember the specific amount. Can someone help me out? One of the ten dollars, okay, and that'll go through Presbyterian Women to Church World Service. So if you'd like to do that, you can give toward that today. It's a blanket that looks like our sheet from heaven this morning, minus animals. <laughs> um, But whether we give toward this or toward the church, it's actually all of our lives which we give to the Lord. And so I would invite you to raise your hands in a posture of sacrifice and let us dedicate ourselves to God for the week. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, for giving us life, for giving us your love, for calling us your own, for removing barriers between us even in this congregation over the years, for giving us money to share, for giving us passions to serve others, for giving us jobs in which we can contribute to our community. For all that you give, Father, we thank you. And we now give back to you these gifts and pray that you would use them and us 
for the good of your kingdom and to bless those around us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings We prepare to go. Uh, just a couple notes in our life together. One, there is a brief congregational meeting after worship today in which we'll dissolve 
my pastoral relationship with you effective at the date here. So if you're a member, you're invited to stay for that meeting and to vote. Um, today is Blanket Sunday, which we've also said. Next week there will be a covered dish, which there are details in here. Um, we'd love to have you here to celebrate with you after worship next week. Um, and for the elders here, just a reminder that there's also a brief called meeting after the congregational meeting in the parlor today. Um, so come on over. Uh, the rest you can read in your bulletin or in the Friday email. Um, but now as we prepare to stay and then go, um, remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he also said, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lighting a lamp puts it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to the entire house. So in the same way, let your light shine before others this week, that they might see your good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Okay, we'll call this, I'll call this meeting of the congregation to order. Uh, June, do we have a quorum? Okay, so seeing that we have a quorum, we can attend to the rest of the meeting. Let's open first with a word of prayer. Father, Son, and Spirit, it is good to sing your praises, to tell of your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. And so on this morning, as we have heard of your steadfast